that was a long passage. Doubly blessed. <laughs> uh, as we go today, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer uh, before we move any further. Father God, we praise you today, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful blessing. Lord, we thank you for the, the people that read your scriptures, Lord, and the blessing of hearing your word. Lord, we pray that you will um, speak to our hearts today. As we seek your face, we seek you through your scriptures that you have given us, Lord. We pray that you will, you will, um, you will reveal yourself. Holy Spirit, move within us. Forgive us those sins that when times we've wronged you so that we may be focused on you, pure before you. Touch us with that coal and help us to repent. Move us away and on the path of your righteousness and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Stephen. We've been talking in Acts. We've been talking about Stephen. Now, remember last week, this sermon, I know it was a long passage we read, but it's one of my favorites in the book of Acts. Because this is Stephen's response to what happened last time. Now, if you remember, Stephen was a holy man, one of the deacons, one of the seven people they called out to, uh, to minister to the widows and orphans of the Greek community, Greek Jewish community that were being overlooked by the other Jewish community. And so they called out Stephen, and as Stephen was helping, waiting on tables, as the book of Acts talks, tell, calls it, he began preaching about Jesus Christ. Death, burial, resurrection. How Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. And as he's preaching, one of the synagogues become upset with him and bring false testimonies and lie in court about him. Bring up two things that they say, you are guilty of blasphemy against Moses or the law and blasphemy against the temple. And the Sanhedrin, now if you remember the Sanhedrin, is the religious and political group at the time. The leaders mostly made up of Sadducees, some Pharisees. The Pharisees were like the, 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 one of the, the groups of religious people, the Jews that were like, had all the rules. They were the popular class. The Sadducees were the wealthy people. And um, they were the leaders, and they wanted to kill Stephen for preaching in the name of Jesus. Someone they had said, don't do. They told Peter and John, don't do this. Now Stephen's doing it. And they're saying, don't do it. And they want to kill him. They want to make him a uh, guilt. And they say, well, here's this man who's guilty of these crimes. Now, Stephen offers his response, and that's what we read today was his response. Now, he doesn't give a defense in the sense of an explanation or an apology or, or trying to get an acquittal, like a not guilty. He proclaims the Christian message that Jesus is God, and he uses terms that were popular in the Jewish thoughts of the day. And so he lays an indictment against the Jewish leaders for their failure to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And before the fall of the temple in AD 70 to the Romans, there are three great pillars of popular Jewish piety. That's a fun, fun sentence. Isn't it? Popular Jewish piety. I like alliteration. Um, were land, law, and temple. And that's what he addresses in this passage. The first thing he addresses is the land. He addresses land. And can you go to the next slide, please? The land. That's section 7, 1 through 36. That was the first section that Joan so wonderfully read for us. Um that the land was, was um, sorry, was, um, was not to be venerated. See, first thing Stephen does is he gives a history of the Jewish people. This is something they would have known and understood. This is their history. 
and he gives a wonderful summation, and I love it, of Genesis through Exodus. Right there, summation of the passage from Genesis to Exodus, and then he gives brief glimpses of Numbers and Joshua and Judges, all right there in his speech. And there's, as he's speaking, these are the religious people. Remember, these are the religious leaders. They'd be like, we know this. You're not telling us anything we don't know. What about the... Because they remember, they started out, are these things true? And he's, they're like, when are you going to get to answering our question? Are these true? And so he gives by giving this history of Jewish tradition. But he argues in a sense that God has been working, and he puts emphasis on God's working outside of Jerusalem, outside of Israel, because he wants to emphasize that God is not just in Jerusalem, not just in Israel, not just in the temple. God is a God of all nations, and he takes it all, and, and he does activities all throughout, even Palestine and Egypt, through, uh, not just in Palestine, but in Egypt and the Chaldean, the Mesopotamia region. And anywhere that God meets his people, that's Holy Land. That's Holy Land. Not just where. They wanted to meet him. Holy ground. And see, they had the attitude that God only was, this is the holy ground, and then God will never let anything bad happen to Jerusalem or to Israel or the temple because that's holy ground. But we've already seen In the book of Isaiah, and they knew this, but they weren't intellectually processing it. That God, yes, he will. (laughs) That led to the Babylonian exile. But what they've done is they've venerated the land. Now, veneration means to lift up. So they venerated, they lift up the land as many salvation, a salvific act. Now, this attitude that God's holy land, holy ground is the only place that God will meet is the same kind of attitude that led to the Mesopotamian uh, exile. It's the same thing that led to the Crusades. Remember the Crusades, if you read your history books, where people said, well, we've got to conquer the holy land? Because God can't be where we're at. has to go conquer the holy land. And, but they venerated it up as a, God, a salvific act. They've placed their rest in this land. And in a sense, that's what the Bible said, that it was going to be a promised land, a place flowing with milk and honey, a place of rest. Even Noah, uh, Noah was supposed to be a, a man of rest, to bring rest. That's what Noah means, is rest. And But what they've done is they've, They've, they said, well, we need this place. And in this place, there's no room for a Messiah because we've already got the land. What we need is someone to kick the Romans out of our land. Because Sadducee, the, the Sadducees, they weren't even looking for a physical Messiah. They were looking for something else. But we as Christians, we can bridge the gap of time and we can look at our own lives in the same temptation with our own possessions, can we not? As little salvific acts. Like this is where my peace comes from. My property. My house. My bank account. My friends. My Bible, my, my health, my church. You know, the Bible doesn't call this church the house of God. It calls it the house of prayer. Why? Because God says the church is something else, right? What is the church? It's the body of believers. It's the people. 
where God has made his home, inside of us. The Holy Spirit has come and lived inside of us. But we look for little salvations in possessions. And if we have this, then we don't really need Jesus. I don't need Jesus. I've got my Bible I can rely on. It makes me feel good, right? Because we skip all the bad passages, just the feel-good passages. I have my, my church that I can rely on, which is a good thing, but we, it's not salvation. It's not the salvation. We have our money, our health. That's why health and wealth theology is so popular today, because we want our own little salvation away from the one who saves us. And what he does is he doesn't promise that everything's going to be wonderful. He promises you to, that you'll get the chance to pick up your cross daily, which is a mode of execution. He promises you that they will reject you. He promises you that you will be suffering. He promises you that he will be with you even though you're going to suffer. He never promises you roses. Of course, even roses has their thorns. But they put their faith in the land, and 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 um, and Stephen says, "You know what? This God is bigger than just this land." And remember, they're getting ready for God to reveal to them that they need to go to. The Gentiles is more than just the Jews. And this is something God is building up their, their mindsets for. It's a transition that they're making. It doesn't happen just to flip the switch. That's not how transitions happen. They build up. And it's getting ready to go out into all the land. And, and they're already facing the, the reality that the Greek Jews are not getting what the Hebrew Jews are having. And they're saying, well, well God is for God of all the people. All who have accepted him as the Messiah. And, and so they're saying the land is a falsehood that we cannot rely upon as, yes, it was a place for rest, but since we have turned away the one who, from the one who have given it to us, then it will fall. It's not our salvation. So he goes on and he turns to the law. The law in 737 through 43 is his next turn of focus. That... Not only had you venerated the land, lift up the land, but you've also venerated the law of Moses. Now Moses represents all the instruction and the Torah, uh, the, um, the law of the first five books of our Bibles. And he represents everything in there. And, um, and, and it says you've lifted him up out of his place. That is to say they've turned it into a moral rule book to be followed, not instructions about God's working with us, God's grace and mercy upon us. And we too have that temptation in our lives, do we not? To venerate moral law codes, to venerate the rules you're not a Christian if you don't do X, Y, Z. If you do X, Y, Z, you... A, B, C, that's how we get to Jesus. We act as if like we can obtain truth and hold it and present it so that as long as you have it, then you're saved. But that's not how the Bible presents truth. We look at truth like, this is truth. I hold it in my hand. There you go. I hold this. This is truth. I hold it. I can give it to you. That's not how truth is presented in the Scriptures. Scru truth in the Scripture is presented in a path you walk. It's a journey you move along. I grew up around the Navajos, and I love the way they, 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 they speak in their, their religious practices. Everything's a way, a path. There's the pollen path. There's the healing way. There's the, 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 and those who follow Jesus follow the Jesus way. 
It's all about the path that they follow. And that's how the Bible presents truth. If you want to walk on the truth of Jesus, that means you're walking as his disciples. It's a path you follow as his disciple. It's not something you obtain, keep, put in your pocket, and then you can pull it out and give it to this person, but not that person. It's a path you follow and walk in it every day. And they've made it into a bunch of rules and regulations that no one can actually follow. And we do that too sometimes. We make rules and regulations because we don't want certain people to follow. Being holy isn't about being better than someone else, about following a checklist. Being holy, the word holy in the scriptures means to be pulled out or set apart. God is making you unique. If you have been born again, which means you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, in John chapter 3, he talks about you must be born again, which means you are in a new life. And if you're in this new life, he's making you something unique. Pulling you apart from the rest of the world. Saying, this is my child who's unique. And I'm making him into something great. Her into something wonderful. And they're unique. And therefore, they are holy because they're walking in the path of truth. Which means they're following Jesus as his disciple. How do we disciple? We follow Jesus as a disciple because disciples make disciples make disciples. True disciples are always looking to disciple someone else. And holiness flows out of us because we're walking the path of Jesus. We go where he wants us to go. We say what he wants us to say. We stay away from things he says stay away from. He warns us against not because we have laws that we've written to check off to keep us better than someone else or to save us. That's not how it works. And they've done that. And so when Stephen is accused against blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Stephen argues that you venerated the law, but he argues two distinct points. Moses himself spoke of God later rising up a prophet like me from among his people and for his people. That's in Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 says, Yahweh, your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses speaking, from your midst, from your countrymen, and to him you shall listen. And so Stephen is saying, see, Moses said it. Jesus is it. They don't want to hear it. He goes on to say, Moses had rejected by his own people, even though he was God's appointed redeemer. And we can see examples. I didn't bring up one passage because there's lots of them. Go read Exodus, Numbers. They're always like, Moses, why'd you do this to us? We're going to overthrow you. Um... And Stephen parallels that and how Jesus was rejected by his own. So he says, the land is not, you venerated the land, you've lifted up out of place, you've venerated the land, it can be destroyed. God is not just here. The law is not about rules and regulations. You've lifted it up out of its place. It is not salvation. He will go on to say, and he'll really step on toes with this one, the temple temple is not about salvation because he was accused of blasphemy against the temple and he turns around and accuses them of venerating the temple above what it is to believe that God only is in the temple that he is in his resting place Say, but God is not restricted to just the temple. And aren't we tempted to do the same thing? God is only in our church. Not in other churches, our church. 
God is only in America. He's not in other countries, just America. I gotta say it right, America. Because we venerate it out of place. It doesn't belong there. None of that is true. God is not just in one location. We have brothers and sisters in all nations around the world. Places where they are persecuted and places where they're not. We have wonderful family that is bigger and we venerate it and we venerate days as well like god is only he, he's not even at church all week long anymore he's just on sundays right it's not even the sabbath it's just sunday the sabbath was saturday and we kicked him out of there we'll move him to sunday for some reason and actually I, we we move it to sunday and and we'll put him only on sundays that's the only day he gets to talk and maybe we'll give them Easter and Christmas. I always laugh, you know, like we venerate Christian holidays as well. Like Christmas and Easter, those are okay. Halloween, not okay. Even though Halloween, Christmas, and Easter are all based on pagan religions. I mean, your Easter bunny, pagan religion. Santa Claus, pagan religion. Christmas tree, pagan religion. Holly, pagan religion. Personally, I like Halloween. It's one of my favorites. I get to dress up, and you guys don't look at me like I'm weird. <laughs> Even though I do it all year round. <laughs> Love cosplay. But we, we venerate things, and we lift them up. Places they don't belong. And that's why we get things like Easter-only Christians. Because that's the only time God matters, right? When God is there all year round, all the time. So they, he says, you venerated the land, you venerated the law, you venerated the temple, which you guys are guilty. You're guilty. So 751 through 53, he just flat out says, you guys, you guys are accusing me? You guys are the guilty ones. Let's read that last little bit again because that's so good. I love this part. That last little bit. You stiff-necked people, unwilling to bow your head, humble yourself, change your ways. So that's a stiff-necked people. You can't look to the left. You can't look to the right. You can't bow your head down. You can't look up at the Father. You're stiff. All you can do is keep the course you're on. You can't see anything around you. Stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts. Now, they've got circumcised bodies. because That's part of being Jewish. You circumcise on the eighth day. They're saying your hearts are not circumcised. Which we say is a New Testament thing, but it's not. It was actually in the Old Testament talking about circumcision of the heart. Your uncircumcised hearts and ears mean you're unwilling to, you can't hear, you can't, you're, you can't, uh, your, your hearts are not rest. You are always resisting the Holy Spirit as your ancestors did. You do also. So just like they did in Isaiah, you guys are doing it too. Just like they did in Jeremiah, you guys are doing it too. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? Can you name one of them? They have been killed, those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, who, whose betrayers and murderers now you have become. Remember, you guys are the one who killed Jesus. You received the law under the direction of angels, yet you have not kept it. You venerate it as your salvation, but you're not keeping it. Well, that reminds me of, um, of people that, that venerate the Bible. The Bible is holy, and it is holy. It's so holy, however, we don't want to read it, because then we might actually have to do something with it. And he says, you're guilty. The kind of behavior that Stephen tells them that they're guilty of sets them off. And they will kill Stephen. They will kill him. 
And he will be a martyr for Jesus, the first martyr for Jesus, but not the last. But as we look at our own lives, as we look at our own lives, we look at what does this mean for us? Are we raising up, are we venerating things outside of God that don't need to be venerated? Are we lifting up things in the improper places? Even things that are good can be lifted up to an improper place in our lives. Food. Where do you get your comfort from? Are we getting our comfort from the comforter, the Holy Spirit? Or are we getting our comfort from that stuff we put in our belly? Because I'll tell you what, that belly is just going to make you uncomfortable in a few hours. People, the saints, we can raise up the saints where they don't belong. Pastors. Pain and suffering. We can venerate pain and suffering. We're Christians because we suffer. Have you ever met like one of those perpetual victims? They're going to heaven because of how much they suffer. We laugh, but I've met a few. We can venerate Christian work. God's work is important, and we want you to sign up for things. But guess what? If you're putting it above God, if you're putting it above your family, which God says is your first ministry, then you've got it out of place. And then if you're not signing up for it because you, you don't want to, and you're making someone else do more work than they should, then maybe you're contributing to the problem in someone else's life. When we venerate things out of position, it doesn't matter if they're good or bad. They're not in the right place. And when we venerate things out of position, we look for that for salvation, not Jesus Christ. We may never say that's what we're doing, but our actions reveal it. When we're trying to get our comfort, our salvation, our peace from something that isn't Jesus, isn't the Holy Spirit, then we're looking for stuff that doesn't exist. It's not going to work. It's out of position. And that's why we, and God tells us how we're supposed to put things in place, right? He tells us love God, right? Love God. That's what the first thing is love God. Love God with your, your heart, your soul, your spirit, your very, all that makes you, you love God. And we have to keep that in position, too, because we love God. God is love. Love is not God. God is love. Love is not God. We can get those two confused, can't we? We love God. We love ourselves. Not the old self, but the new self that God is making us into. We deny self. We deny our old self, but that doesn't mean hate yourself. That means love the self that God is making you into because he is making you unique and set apart and you are wonderful and you, in God, are a new creation with a new birth. What a blessing that is. So we love God. The new self. We don't love the old self. And those things, you know, those old selves, they'll pop up from time to time, right? They always do because we're still in our corrupt bodies with our corrupt earth, with our corrupt minds. They'll still pop up. So we got to deny our old self and let that new self that we love, that God is putting us to shine through. And we love our neighbors and our, our, we'll love our neighbors with the reflection of how we love ourselves. So if you don't like yourself, you ain't going to like your neighbors. We love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we love others, and we love them. That means that we point them in the right directions. It means we show grace in abundance. In the same way grace has shown you. I, you know, I always laugh how much we, we like to receive grace. We don't like to give grace. 
We like to be unforgiving and hateful people. But as I say that, I must temper that because God does not say, let people walk all over you. That is not what the grace means. It does not say, be a doormat. It doesn't say, someone can hurt you. Grace means that if they are willing to change, if they repent, then you can forgive them and maybe even reconcile. No repentance, no change, no reconciliation. You can still forgive them. That means you let God handle it, not yourself. But there may be no reconciliation. There doesn't have to be reconciliation. You can live at peace with people because you've forgiven them and still not reconcile with them. God does not want you to show a false grace that leads you open to be hurt all the time. Because he loves you, and he doesn't want you being hurt. But he does want you to show grace. So as people repent, they're walk, you're walking on the path of truth, and someone steps up. Yes, it might hurt, might hurt you, but they're wanting to repent, so they step back on the path of truth with you, and you repent, and you reconcile, and you move forward together, and you guys, and then you step off, and they get to show you grace, and. <laughs> And we as a community go forward in grace, abundant grace, because we know that we're trying to walk the path of truth together. We walk the path of truth. And we keep things in our proper positions that God first, and as he shows his love through us, it spreads to the world around us. What a blessing that is. So today, we have to ask ourselves, the immediate question is, is number one, have we accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that means you're not walking in the path of his discipleship. That's what it means to be Lord and Savior of your life. It means you're walking as his disciple. It's not just to say, well, I believe in him. Well, yes, even the demons, it says the Bible, even the demons do that too must be walking as his disciple. Which means you're going to change your ways. You're going to repent. You're going to do things that seem counterintuitive because you're walking as his disciple. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, you said, but we're going to offer a time of invitation. Now's the time to do it. We'll come pray with you. You can do it at your seat, but we're going to ask you to make it public right here. We'll pray with you. Say, well, I need to be baptized. I've accepted Jesus as my Christ, but I've never let people know about it. I've never followed him in the sign of, 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 of obedience, which is baptisms, which represents being born again, death, burial, and resurrection, walking in a new life. So I need to do that. I want to make Laughlin Community Church my home. Amen. If you are part, if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are part of the church as a whole. If you join Laughlin Community Church, it's like, this is my landing zone. This is my LZ. This is my battle zone. This is my family. This is my group of believers that I'm fighting this war with. This is where I'm stationed. Whatever word you want to say with it, this is your home base. That's what joining the family means. That's what joining the church means. We're going to work together together to spread Jesus Christ, to disciple one another, to, to grow. So you need to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Now is the, you want to come and baptize. We're going to offer that time of invitations. Now is the time to do it. I want to join the church. Now is the time to do it. I need to pull out my phone. You're not going to fit me pull out my phone. That's one of the great things about having a young pastor, right? You pull out your phone. You make those plans right now. You make that checklist, things you got wrong in your life. That's fine. Whatever you need to do, you make that plan. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block my computer right now because I know as soon as I get home, I need to throw that thing away because it's leading me down the wrong path. Whatever needs to happen, you go ahead and take This is we invite you to take next steps. Our praise team is going to come. Um, we're going to worship together. I'm going to be up at the front. Will you come? Pastor Tristan's in the back. You need to speak to him back there. Pray with him back there. You want to just pray at the altar, pray at your seat, raise and worship. We're going to do that together. Let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer.
Father God, we praise you today, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful blessings. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts today, Lord, that you help us to get our house in order, things we've lifted up out of position, whether it be self or, or things of this world or, or anything else that we can put, even good things, out of place. But, Lord, you, you show us that and help us to put that back into its proper place. Lord, I pray that you um, are the master of our lives and that you direct us and guide us. Lord, I pray that for each person here in this room and that is joining us online, that these, these wonderful people that are alive with us, that you bring us together as a family, as, as warriors together in your name. Lord, that we are able to stand true with things in their proper place as we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.